amazing. It has so many resources. And so when, when we're coaching teachers, when we're working with a grade level group of teachers, when we're working with the two fifth grade teachers in a school, and I've got some real time, I find that the toolkit gives me an amazing array of resources. And then I just want to say one other thing. NCTM took, just came out with two new books. Um, they had Catalyzing Change in 2018 for high school. I have major problems with that. I'm not happy with it, what NCTM has done at high school, but the brand new Catalyzing Change for early childhood and elementary school is phenomenal. It is so crisp and so clear and so powerful. And so all of us who are working with teachers and trying to get these changes, that's just a great resource for us to get our act together on these things. And I strongly urge that we get some copies of that. We flow it around. I think there's an electronic copy that we can probably share. Um, I read it and, and got to review it. I think that, you know, I have a blurb on the back page but I can't tell you how enthusiastic I am about it. Now I go running around saying, if only the high school volume was as good as the, as the elementary, duh. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, I, I like the concept of, I saw the concept of the, the, the thinking behind the high school. The idea was sounded good. I just, uh, the way it was done, maybe yeah. not so much. So. Yeah, and there, there are three or four really, three or four really important things in there, um, but they're all done better um in the um elementary one that's great i love the idea well then we have next year's study um that's good um i i like that okay so that's that's good thinking um so one of the things that i keep hearing though is this fits into the context of the bigger picture right so can we take a, a, a poorly designed task or like how do you talk with teachers you know the teachers we work with are really taught to lecture right that's the way you're supposed to teach Alex, you had such a good point. I, this is the foundation of what we do, is you have to experience the math differently, I think, before you think about teaching it. I think maybe a challenge, though, as a teacher, is like in my workshop, and, and that I take these games that I got from Linda mostly, and we do you know, addition or place value. So now a teacher thinks, oh my gosh, I could do place value differently, but then when it comes time to do addition or bulk division, it's back to lecture. How do we help them see that this is a, every subject in full circle? And you know, Susan, your gang, you guys do this probably all the time. And I know Steve and Linda do too, but what are your, like, what are your tricks? Before, we, before I hear your tricks, tell me, um, like the, our team, Callie and um, Alex and everyone, what's your experience helping teachers like, step outside of that? I, I have one idea of that. And when Molly says that teachers have to work with their expectations and they need to trust a little bit more in children, it's also a big trust is connected with how they are afraid, how afraid they are mm -hmm. of making many mistakes. And that's why they don't want to try anything else. And that's why they think they have to know a, the, uh, the whole bunch of representations and they need to know before the students. And and uh, that's why they don't want to try or let the students think differently because they feel they lose control. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the first steps we have to make on. Make them feel comfortable, not knowing everything and saying, well, we can learn together and we, you, the, the way you're thinking is really great and accepting everything that's going on on the class. So I think that's one of the first steps. I like that yeah. idea. I, I think too about the this piece about expectations and how often even when teachers are ready to take a risk and they say, okay, fine, I will ask my students how they would solve it. Their students have spent six years being told, if you do it differently from me, you're wrong. The student's initial response is often, I will do it exactly the way I've always been taught to do it. And if you haven't told me anything, I will sit here and wait until you tell me something. And so then teacher's reaction can be, well, that didn't work. And so recognizing and supporting, this is where like follow up the, and coaching is 
the fact that we want to build connected programs rather than a one-time experience really comes into play because we're able to be with our teachers through that process. And um, I always use examples from the Girls STEM Club, but I think about like you know, when we would create an open task and not um, explain how to do it and like really had to pull back the reins of the teacher leaders so that they wouldn't tell the students a way to do it. And what we would see a lot is like maybe one group would start to have an idea and then everybody around that group would look at their idea and then all of their ideas would look like that one group's idea. And even in that, when I think about it, like as they're building from this place of what do you mean I'm allowed to use my own thinking? Like that's okay because each, each time that happens, it gives them a window into here's another way to think. Here's another way to think. And I think like I, as I read this and think about it too, this piece about connections among representations is so, so important because without the connections, what is the representation? You know, like how do we pull meaning from that? And even I was having a conversation with my siblings who are helping a neighbor or something with some math and they were like talking about the area model and they were like, well, this is just ridiculous. And I was like, no, it's not. Let me tell you about how I've worked with the area model with my fourth graders and how like what they were able to accomplish. But that like, it's the connection piece. Like they, you know, cause I asked them the question. I was like, okay, so when you think about multiplying two digit numbers, what's happening? Can you look at the, the algorithm and explain to me what's happening? And, um, and they were like, well, no. And so, you know, once when kids are able to understand the area model and connect that back, then they can explain, they understand what's happening. And so I like this idea of like the connections between all of the representations helps us to like paint a deeper picture and, um, and understand better, but recognizing that it also takes time and both students and teachers, um, like we have to create spaces where it's okay for them to take risks and like there is some unlearning that has to has to happen, particularly as we continue to get, um, like once they've had more years in the system. Mm -hmm. So the operative word is patience, forbearance. Recognize that what you just described, Kali, is so real. We all face it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it argues for how do you change mindsets? But seriously, that's what you're asking people to do. Mindsets are incredibly comforting and they work and they help us in so many ways. They frame who we are. And what we're talking about here is changing mindsets. So number one, patience and a recognition that nobody does this in a week or even in a year. It's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. I'm ecstatic when somebody does it with fractions because they hated fractions. They know they're not good at it, but they can't seem to do it for division because it's not as comfortable. They don't have the same skills. And so um, I argue that um, we, re we rely on what we know about language arts. All of the people who struggle with math understand that you cannot flip a switch and have kids not writing on a Monday and writing on a Tuesday. That writing is something that progresses gradually when we give kids opportunity to write, give them feedback, and ask them to rewrite. That's the process. Well, if that's how people finally become writers, and we know that it is a 10-year process, then why would we think anything other than changing our mindsets about math and how to teach it is anything different? We, we, we have opportunities to try it. We get feedback. We make some adjustments. And that's where the coaching comes in. I mean, you know, people have heard me say this before, and some of the people on this call have seen it. But when we were last in Guatemala, oh, fondly, I wrote to someone this morning saying that, you know, Steve's normal five continents in five months ended abruptly when we returned from Guatemala on March 9th. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't expect to be on a plane again until um, October or November. I mean, life has just been strange. But, um, but when we were in Guatemala, um, Fatima just took over the class. I mean, the teacher wasn't feeling well. And every one of those kids, but more importantly, the teacher, got a chance to see that you can do it differently, that you can see it differently, that you can think about it differently. And the only thing we didn't really have time to do then is that critical 15-minute discussion afterwards between Fatima and the teacher about, so what did I do and, and how did it work? And, and you know, you find that the kids um, really 
groove on that stuff, to use a very old word, because I got up early this morning and I have been doing memories of uh, 1968 for my 50th reunion that comes up next May. Wow. So I'm still grooving. I sent pictures of a Wesleyan concert when the Grateful Dead were there in 1960, <laughs> 1970. 50 years ago. Anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. You're laughing. Oh my gosh, you guys are saying so many things. I keep writing these notes down. I go, oh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about that. And well, Are you recording um, this? Yes. I, 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 I started recording it. Yes, I did start recording everyone. If you have a problem, let me know. But um, I, after a couple, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get this down because um, really good things are coming out of this. Um, one thing that, can I, I want to go back because one thing I thought is really important um, is we have to think about a way for, especially internationally, where there's this very sort of patriarchal, the authority knows model um, to help the teachers um, make mistakes, but not because they're making mistakes, but because they know their craft. And um, I wonder if we could say to them, your job is to make a mistake as a teacher today and have your students help pull you out of that. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that would float, um, I know Fatima, that would be a question maybe for you to answer and for someone would be willing to interpret it because you taught um, right there, um, or Paul even. What would, how would you respond if, if, your te if someone said, your job today is to make a mistake as a teacher? Um, okay, I'm just gonna translate really quick for Fatima then. Entonces, Fatima, la pregunta es, Um, ¿qué, ¿Qué pasaría si dijeras a un, un docente que lo que tiene que hacer en la clase es cometer un error? Es como eso lo que tienen que hacer, los alumnos tienen que apoyar a que el docente pueda como entender lo que fue el error. O sea, todo sería a propósito, pero como que, ¿qué tipo de respuesta te darían y estarían dispuestos a hacerlo o no? ¿Qué piensas? Depende con qué maestro sea, ¿verdad? Y depende mucho de, de lo que hablábamos, ¿verdad? La confianza que uno les vaya a, a dar a ellos. Porque eh, uno me va a decir, bueno, sí, yo lo hago, pero otro me va a decir, los alumnos no van a ver porque van a creer. O, ni los alumnos le van a tener la confianza al maestro para decirle que el maestro tiene un error. Entonces, es lo que siempre yo juego y es como a lo que me enfoco siempre, que hay que tener tanto alumno con maestro, mucha confianza para que ellos mismos puedan decirle, mire, cometió un error. Y que ellos acepten que su maestro también puede cometer errores y que es normal todo esto. Okay, so first thing she says is that it depends a lot on what teacher, right, to start with, because um, this whole interaction would require so much trust um, between the students and the teachers, and not every teacher has that relationship with their students, to be able to even question their teacher if they were to make an, an error or a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's like a, a crucial part of being able to do that, and then to be able to say like, hey, you did this wrong, or there's an error, or whatever, it may be like that interaction in itself. So Fatima is um, really focusing on the, the trust aspect of, of that, to be able to make a mistake in front of the class and then and then um, have them help to fix it. Mm -hmm. Pero personalmente me encantaba hacer mucho eso. Yo lo hacía mucho con mis alumnos. Y era como, bueno, vamos a resolver un problema, por decirlo así, ¿verdad? Y yo trataba de confundirme o hacía algún proceso mal o alguna operación y era como se me miraban. Y me decían, ¿verdad? Al más de alguno, siempre tenía como levantada su manita o me decía, señor, usted se confundió ahí. Yo era como, ah, sí, decime, ¿en qué me confundí? Le decía yo, explícamelo, le decía yo, ¿verdad? Y empezaban, y, y de al otro, de la otra mesa, porque lo tenía como en mesas, ¿verdad? Desde la otra mesa o del otro grupo, es que usted hizo mal esto, me decían ellos, ¿verdad? O aquí se confundió en este número, o y entonces le decía, ¿por qué? Y era como bien interesante, porque era como el resultado final, donde yo sabía que habían comprendido lo que estábamos haciendo, porque ya no era yo la que estaba dando la clase en otras palabras, sino que eran ellos los que a base de la experiencia de todo lo que hicimos, me iban diciendo cuáles eran los procesos que había que mejorar en ese punto, ¿verdad? Y siempre tenían ellos algo muy claro que yo por ser maestra no siempre tengo la razón y lo que yo me puedo confundir y por eso, y les decía a ellos, estamos aquí ambos porque ambos vamos a aprender. Yo aprendo con ustedes y ustedes aprenden conmigo. 
So she used to love to do this in her class, actually, would love to do exactly what you're describing, which is to make a mistake in front of the class and then mm-hmm. ask them, like, what did I do wrong? How do I fix this? And they would raise their hands and they would like tell her what the mistake was or like, teacher, you did this thing wrong or like they were they would contribute their thoughts to the process and that would really help her to break down the the process with them and kind of see like what they had to work on what they understood um so fatima loved doing that in her class and creo que sí como que lo o sea no voy a incluir todos los detalles pues porque se me olvidaron un poquito pero creo que sí ahí estamos con la la el resumen ¿no? There's something that Fatima says, and uh, that's also related with Kali, with what Kali said, is that uh, the first thing is well, t- working with teachers that uh, have to build this safety space, that even they have the trust, they trust themselves to do this kind of things. Uh, the students' reaction is really interesting. Because as Kali said, this student has been taught the same way. So the first reaction is even they see that the teacher is making any mistake, they won't say anything because they are not used to and they're really afraid of saying, oh, I think this is differently. Because they, the first thought they might have is, well, if I think that's a mistake and nobody's saying anything, then I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing uh, happening. That's something that makes me think why our work is so important. Because we are not just uh, living with teachers, we are also working with them in classes. So when, when we do this, when we are um, giving this follow-up and being with them, we can talk and about this and actually see what's going on. Otherwise, they won't even see that. Mm-hmm. Yes, and wouldn't it be great if everyone had been taught to think for themselves in our country right now? Um, because... I think that thing that Callie said, students don't realize that they are required to think for themselves. Um, that's the reason I think math is the key to critical thinking and problem solving. Is, um, when you open the door to a lot to multiple representations and making the connections, that's what happens. Um, can, can we move to the, I want to move to the example of the, the sample lesson because I thought that was such a, a great lesson. Um, and um, the first that is there are these three important things, you know? Um, and so I wonder if you guys can describe and would generally describe your thoughts about the lesson and, and what was your takeaway? Do you think it's something that you could do in your space? I think teachers in Ecuador and Guatemala would, would, would be up for that. Um, tell me what your thoughts are about the lesson. And of course, and Heidi, your team too, and everyone, any thoughts? I mean, for me, this we try to work on this stuff with with teachers all the time, and it goes back to both, you know, what everybody is saying here. It's the teacher's level of comfort, um, their what they've projected with their students as the right way and the wrong way. Um, but I think what for me was the takeaway is that you know not only did this teacher ask kids to find a partner that had a different representation but then they added another level to that and then did that again Mm -hmm. so to see that you know there's there's not just two representations there could be three representations that are different and um i think that oftentimes even if teachers think that's a good idea time is your enemy and you may not explore things quite as much as even you might like to because time is always factor um yes but i liked i I mean this was kind of like what we've been talking about right like just giving kids a problem and saying go Mm -hmm. um and that's not comfortable for a lot of teachers but what you know paula and and callie are describing are transitional issues right so if, if we're trying to start doing something like this anything that's new for teachers or anyone is going to have transitional issues so once we can set a stage and a mindset for what we are hoping that kids think on their own. I mean, kids don't think on their own. Again, like the reading thing, they don't start reading the day after you start reading. Like, you know, that takes some time as does writing, as does this. So I think that this is a process that teachers have to understand that you don't just try it once and then it works and then you're golden. 
Um, and that goes along with the whole idea of multiple subject areas, right? Like you've learned how to do this with addition, but now when you get to fractions, you have no idea how to do this. Well, there comes the learning curve again. You have to start all over and figure out what are the representations that make sense. But um, I, I felt like with this lesson, it was um, just giving kids opportunity to see that there's many more ways of representation than just my way or your way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with that completely. Depending on um, even the setup, and we run into this problem in the U.S. all the time where, oh, well, I'm not going to, it goes to the time factor that Molly was talking about. Well, I won't get through the lesson if I spend time doing this. So giving teachers permission and really pushing them to think about, okay, what are what, what are, one or two good problems or tasks that you can do in a lesson versus the page of, you know, in some cases, 40, 50, fair number problems that, right. that you're going to be working on so that we give permission to step away from that and then still show that they're, you're still getting at the same learning. And I think it's very difficult to trust that, like, oh, well, they need the, the practice. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I don't read the same sentence over and over again mm -hmm. when I'm learning to read. Um, it's, you know, it's that same, same piece of understanding what's one or good way that we can look at and really take it apart versus, you know, a whole list of things. But I mean, that's, that's not a problem that's specific to a country. <laughs> we have that problem here too. Of, oh, I won't cover the lesson. Well, what were you really trying to get at? And what representations were you making available and what opportunities for students to make sense of it were you building into the lesson time um and and equating that is just as important or more important than um the practice problem element of it. yeah yeah that's good what other thoughts yeah susan i i was thinking about the use of a vignette or a case study as a really nice tool that's provided in the book. And I think um, it might be interesting to push a little further with it because maybe everyone reads and goes, yep, like that's really great. And then I think we need to say, um, would this work with your students? And you know, why or why, why or why not? Like how do we, what are the barriers to that? So if they say yes, it's, it's like, great, let's now go do that together if you're coaching. And if the answer is no, it's, it's yeah. sort of, why not? What are the barriers that you see that are getting in the way? And can we knock those down one at a time? Because I think we can um, view a good example and agree that it's a good example. And I love the use of case studies, but then I think we need to personalize. And now, now I need to help you put it in action. You know, So it might be interesting if you were to use that case study. Is this, is this um, well, I guess it's for you. I was just wondering if this book is, in, is available in Spanish. Yeah, well, they have it in Spanish. We have it in Spanish. Okay. Yeah, so it might be interesting to take that case study a step further to, to be personalized. Yes, I had a little bit that same question. Um, and there's some distinctions that I see in this case study about the students that this person's working with that are probably not a typical classroom. Um, but what do you think? Answer that question, you know, those of you in the field. Uh, would this work with the students that you see? And if not, what kinds of things do we need to put in place to make it work? I guess if, yeah, Alex or Fatima or Callie or Paul. Callie, can you use the Girls STEM Club and tell me like, would this work with the Girl STEM Club, this this lesson maybe. Yeah, I think so. Um, when I mean, so obviously we haven't done this exact problem, but what we have tried to do is look at and build out different representations um, in getting to the, and, and talking about them as well. 
And then that is, that's an area that we made a lot of progress was being able to have students talk about what they did and not just repeat all of the numbers on their papers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like on our new website, one of the, the picture that's at the top of the girls STEM page is like girls in front of their work. And so them being explain like, well, why did you think about it that way? And, and what's happening there? And, you know, and students were still um, kind of all over the place there as a whole, if you look at the, the group. And it was also a place where, interestingly, you know, so I have been saying as students have been in the system and as they get older, it can be harder for them to to break out of it, but also having older students paired with younger students in that place, that was a really interesting, like when we worked out tasks, that was a really interesting place where the older students were able to lead um, with their groups. And, but even like the girls, when I think about that photo, they were third graders um, and were able to, to talk about how they like created different visual representations I guess pictorial, um, where they were thinking about like how many people could I put in this lifeboat to save everyone from this um, right. Peruvian ship that Ecuador destroyed? Like, mm -hmm. how can we save all the people? How many lifeboats do we need? Um, and they were able to, like, that was one of the places where I think we really saw a lot of different representations and, um, and they were able to start talking about it. So mm -hmm. it's something I think we, should lean more into as we continue. Right. Well, so the thing I'm learning working with Allie so often is how important it is just to be transparent and to say, this is why we're doing the thing we're doing. And what I love in every vignette we've seen so far, um, and, and really they start off by saying, as a teacher, you want to say, here are my goals. And this teacher says, I'm expecting you to find different representations. Now the kids know what a representation is. It's not like a te secret teacher word that they don't really say to the kids. Um, but I love that the teacher is explicit um, with that. And, um, and th that's important. I mean, S Steve and, and Linda and, and even S S Susan, you guys, how, how does, can you do this quickly or virtually? You know, like I hear often, okay, that's great for one school. How do you scale this to the entire continent of South Africa quickly by next week? We can't do it by next week. But, but can you scale it? Is this something you can do virtually? I know, Steve, you travel and do workshops. And then how do you follow up with them? It, or do you, or do you just leave people in place? What's, what's the process for you all that are leaders? You start with an understanding that it's at least a year's worth of work. You um, have some workshops that can be done virtually or face-to-face. -face. There needs to be um, training of two or three or four people on site. Um, you know, depending upon whether it's a school or a district, those people are extra specially trained and those people get to meet every other week in a Zoom conference so that they talk about what worked and what didn't work and what successes they had and what failures they had. And we turn to all of the resources that are out there. You know, I mean, I like the way in which you are separating them out. You have to recognize that you can't do all eight. Um, you know, I, I've argued for years that the um, Common Core Standards have the eight mathematical teaching practices, and frankly, you can't do all, all eight. I think there are only the first four that really matter. I think that the same thing applies here. Um, I, I mean, I think that all eight are important, but it really is, are you talking about planning? Or are you talking about teaching? Are you talking about, you know, the, the, the congealing of, of things? Um, the planning, we spend time just on tasks and goals. Um, and, and, you know, that doesn't take all year, but we're monitoring it. We're doing our goals. We're thinking about tasks. We're looking at resources. I think that the three most important and the three hardest are the questioning, the discourse, and the representations. I think that's where we get out of our comfort zone. We move away from the lecture. And so you, you can't do it in, in short term. And a workshop is useless, except that it raises issues, models some things, and then hopefully gives people some ideas to go back and try. Yes, I like that way where you're talking about weaving into technology so that we don't have to be in person each time. And I hear you say we need to have some anchors on the ground 
you guys have that as well in Boston? And, and then Linda, I want to hear about your experience in Cleveland because I know you're working with a school district there. Yeah, we've um, recently been able to set up what we called lab classrooms and lab as in the world collaborative. So spaces where teachers agree to, like Steve says, some additional training and meetings and then that they will make their learning public. So the ultimate goal is that that's a classroom that people can come into and to, to demonstrate that learning. So um, the, the other piece that's really critical is, as you know, the boots on the ground as far as the, the additional training needs to be the admin. Um, if we don't have the administrators, you know, allowing these people the time to do the extra learning, classroom visits, all of those things, in our experience, we've the deck has not stacked in our favor to make change. So from the beginning, we are including and updating and um, encouraging and coaxing the admin who already has a long list to see the value of being present because when they're not, um, it, it, it really becomes problematic. So, so that that's worked really well. Like as far as you know, it's it's it, this person's getting extra training, but they're also going to make their learning public for for all of you. And then we, the next year, we bring another another crop of people in, and so it's it really is like a three at least a three year process, I think, to feel mm. like we've really moved the needle there. Mm -hmm. I would say too when you have a lab teacher on the ground in that building, then no one can say, oh, well, that worked in a different space, in a different building with a different group of kids. Oh, well, no, these are all, these are all of our kids. And we're, um, you know, when we go in, we're not just like providing a package program that they're doing. Like, so we're adjusting the work that we're doing with those lab teachers to that specific context as well. I think that's the, the critical piece of the work that we do. Okay, so like, what is that gonna look like in your building? So let's facilitate that in your building, which, you know, there are some principles that are the same everywhere, but there are other things that we need to adjust depending on on what's happening in your building and in your, um, within the constraints that you have. Yeah. Linda, were you gonna say, cause I, you're, you're working with a school district in Cleveland and how's that, how's that, what's that model looking like and what's the transition happening? So um, it's actually a district on the east side of Cleveland that's not necessarily a wealthy district, but it's not certainly not an urban district either. Um, getting the administrators involved has been part of the initial plan. We're actually, next year will be the fourth year of a four year um, help to transition the teachers. Um, so the district has been very supportive. Each building has a coach that's a math and literacy coach. Not ideal, but okay. The coaches have grown so much. Um, but right now what we're struggling with, so this also addresses the issue of becoming systemic or sharing things um, on a wider scale. Um, we're dealing with what if the kids don't come back to school in September? How do we help the teachers? I mean, they've had to hit the ground running. They've got a lot of technology platforms that they can use, but they've really, within a week, had to hit the ground running to get their lessons up online and do virtual teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, we're, we're thinking about how do we plan for the fall and do that a little more systemically, and how do I get the coaches more involved? That was year four, then this thing came up and blindsided us. Um, so I'm, I'm actually thinking about Ecuador and Guatemala and even teachers that are quarantined at home and trying to do all this stuff online. Um, and I think that's actually, we may have to learn how we do business a little differently and it, it may be for the better. Um, so training teachers or working with teachers, I hate the word training teachers, but working with teachers in a, in a virtual platform might give people um, the ability to take a little bit more risk. So one of the things that's really hard to do is get teachers to be willing to have other teachers come visit their classroom. Uh, they just worry about that. Most of them aren't real comfortable teaching math, although they've come a long way. So, you know, what if, I, I'm not so worried about blowing it in front of the kids, but I'm certainly worried about blowing it in front of my colleagues. Um, so, so doing it online 
uh, maybe increases the more comfort with taking risk. Um, the other thing though with teaching kids, and this is something I, I talked a lot with the coaches about, was that also, you know, the worksheet doesn't work. Um, whoever mentioned, you know, handing the kids a, a, a sheet with 25 or 30 computation tasks doesn't work so well online. So why not give the kids an open-ended task and give them some time to think about it, play with it, try some different representations. And one of the cool platforms this district has is the kids can turn in their work electronically. So on the next day, the teacher can pick some examples of student work and let the kids talk about that. So I think, um, I actually think this whole virtual stuff may be very helpful in the fact that we don't have the choices to um, maybe try to do this differently. We have to do this differently. So I think the technology, and as we get better with that, is really going to help to make this more systemic. Um, I'm still, I don't know that much about it. I'm still thinking about it, but that's really our task for next year. Because it's likely the kids may come to school two days, so half the class comes to school two days a week, and then the other half comes the other two days a week, but you still got to give the kids something to do the three days that they're not in the classroom. I mean, that's all doing business very differently but it gives us a lot of opportunity to try things and give kids richer tasks. Yes, and I think our place is always gonna to be to help those teachers um, use good pedagogy and good teaching practices um, with this technology, because I'm sure we're gonna see um, opportunities to, to help shape that. And then, and then for us as an organization, teachers to teachers, uh, this allows us to do more work because when we can work virtually, when we're working so remotely um, that that will be helpful and that helps us bring experts like you all to the field virtually as well as in person yeah that's that's good um so we have about 15 or 10 minutes left and i just want to do sort of a wrap up i want to hear like what are your takeaways from this section i think steve you nailed it i mean there are a couple places in here i wish i had been doing when I was teaching, um, I, I wish I did a better job with representations. I wish my students knew what they were. I tried and, and I did some things, but I like the idea of just sharing specifically. Um, what are your takeaways? Anything specific that you want to try to implement? And then when you think about working with the teachers you're working with, how is this helping you or informing that? So don't be shy, there's lots of, you know, you all work with teachers. I mean, I, I think a big theme here was trusting their thinking and letting the student thinking lead. So I think that's in, in, in encouraging um, teachers to shift that mindset to believe in their students' thinking. I think, I think that's a big, a big theme of what we talked about today. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, um, I, I love this. I talk a lot about um, Carpenter and Lair's um, sort of processes to learn something. They call it mathematical processes to learn a mathematical concept. And it's really what you need to do to learn something new. You need to connect to previous knowledge. You need to extend to new topics. You need to make it your own. You need to articulate it to others. And then you need to reflect. And to me, you cannot make it your own unless you understand multiple representations. It's really critical. It also is important to help you connect to previous knowledge. Uh, because if I go straight to abstract, I'm not going to be able to connect the way I want to. So this is fundamental to making the knowledge your own. In my opinion. I think one of the best things of this uh, conversation is um, the connections between the representations and making uh, students and teachers also connect different ways and uh, making this thinking visible in out loud so they can actually talk about that is really great because it's not enough i think it's a great way of starting just giving students or teachers in our case when we're working with teachers the to try to think first in different ways of thinking but after that we need to wrap that we need to talk about that with purpose and we have intentionally we need to make those connections and that makes the lesson and the whole thing really powerful Mm -hmm. I like that. I think another one 
that came up in various points of the meeting was about just the consistency and the need for follow-up with like the, the workshop kind of mindset that it doesn't change from one workshop to another that might be like dipping your toe into it but it doesn't mean like it's like you have to manage your expectations about what is real for teachers when they're making a big change like that and also for administrators or anyone else that might sort of think that like this should change the math like right now why did they not after one workshop suddenly completely change the way that they're teaching and i think that's something that comes up a lot in the work that we do and just like managing those expectations around what's real and like the kind of follow-up having people on the ground that are doing that um that sort of coaching and being there when we're not one conference isn't going to change everything like i think those are things that um i definitely heard at different points today and i think they're super central and important to the work that we do mm -hmm. alex i also want to give you credit because you said something that really is going to stick with me and that is um we have to be deliberate about explaining or helping the people we're working with understand this isn't something you check off you don't go oh I've done the picture oh done this done the, now let me get to the stuff i know which is to lecture to them this is the process so that's that's something we want to remind them and help them understand that nuance that step and i would add to that um i think one of the things that we can do to help convince teachers why this is so important is really build that um, idea of deeper learning that I, or deeper understanding um, mm -hmm. because even if i can solve a problem in multiple ways um that helps me to understand more deeply what's going on um and so some people will blow off the area model for multiplication for example and say oh that's just a waste of time. No, if you really think about that area model, it really helps me to understand the distributive property and partial products and where all that's coming from. Um, or even back up a little bit, just what does it mean to multiply? What does it mean to divide? And take a look at the different contexts that we're using um, and the representations kids use. Because um, I think our goal is, re is really to build an understanding of what I'm doing in mathematics. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, um, one of my stories as a mathematician um, really is credited to Carol Molloy because I had a master's degree in statistics and I had done a lot of, like I'd done graduate geometry course and I was trying to do, I was taking, you know, teaching pedagogy courses with her and she had a geometry course that she was teaching. I went into her class like, Carol, I've taken like three graduate geometry courses. I really don't need this class. She goes, yeah, you do. Oh. Yeah, I know. That's what she said. She goes, just come. And um, and so I went in the first day and, you know, and I was like Cal, I was blown away by the fact that I was using manipulatives and tools to um, to explore the mathematics. And I gained a, such a deeper understanding about it, even though I could tell you about the multiple parallel lines and what they look like. I didn't understand it in this way. So I think these multiple representations um, are really critical. And more importantly, it allows everyone to contribute because I know I had a, a deeper knowledge of advanced math than a lot of the people there who were going to be elementary teachers, but they blew me away with their thinking because they represented this concept in a way that I hadn't thought about. And it taught me as a teacher just to shut up. In fact, Carol told me that once. She just she put her hand on my shoulder. She goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm telling them I have the answer. I want to show them. She goes, exactly. Stop. And um, helped me a lot. So that's the thing that this allows you to do. I, I want to share something. Uh, last week, I was uh, my, my, my I, well. I have two kids, and my son is eight years old, and he was really mad at me we, because we were solving a problem, and he was mad at me. So because that sometimes I'm pushing too hard, <laughs> maybe. And she, she, he asked me to talk to her teacher, and I said, "Well, that's great because um, I trust her. She, her teachers, his teacher is really great." But uh, I was listening to his conversation and make me think a lot. And uh, I want to share that because it makes sense with what we are talking right now. Because um, he was complaining that I was trying to solve the problem with too many different ways. He was mad at me because we were, I was pushing him and I asked him if he didn't think different ways. And he was, mom, we did it. We have the solution. So why you are still working on that? Just leave it. So he went to his teacher and said, um, 
I want to I wanna know why we need to know so many ways of solving this. And, uh, and um, she said, well, when you solve a problem, do you use always the same way, the same way of, sol of solve it? And he said, no. But the problem is that sometimes all this kind of uh, ways of solving and um, tools that my mom is giving me make my head a mess because I don't know how to use um, which uh, tool or which way sometimes is really hard for me and it's best if I have just one and use it and that's all. And she said, well, I, I understand what you are going through. And um, I know the problem is that sometimes you are trying with one way and it's not the best for you sometimes, but it's really great to have this uh, box tool in your head. And she said something really nice. I love the idea she said. And don't worry, we're gonna work on that. We are gonna wrap all of these ways in the, and, and connect them and make them a loop so we can all have this mess in boxes and also try to, di to differentiate one from each other. So you can connect them all and separate when you need it. And also when we are doing this loop, when you use some of them and you took one from the, your box and does it not work? Then you can find the loop, the, the, the connection and pull a little bit more and you will find another one. So that's the way you will start thinking. And I love that idea. Just thinking Great. of boxes and wrapping things and ideas. And you have all these boxes full of strategies. And he was calmed down because he thought, well, my box tool is really a mess. Mm -hmm. But I glad, I'm glad you said you're going to work with, uh, with me on making this mess uh, a little bit more. Nice. Uh, uh, order I would like. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's good. Yeah. That's what I we're here. I just want to say that we're getting close to the end. I am so impressed with you guys. I am just, mm -hmm. um, you, you just, you get it. And um, you're just awesome. It just makes me so excited. I, Chad has heard this. When I hang up, sometimes Chad and I will talk a little bit. And um, you guys are just amazing. Yeah, I agree. That's why I frantically started recording this. Yeah. All right. Any last comments or thoughts? But, but everyone take a look at Naomi's green room. I thought that's very cool that you have that back there, Naomi. I was trying. I made my own green screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can um, share my takeaways really quickly, too. And it, it also what you were just talking about, Chad, and then going into what Pal said, it reminded me of when I taught in the Dominican Republic and I had a combo class of like fourth through sixth grade, but there was also a third grader and a seventh grader. And I was trying to figure out like, what do I do with all of my students? And my third grader, um, she, she is very gifted and her mom really pushed me. It was, was really confrontational at the beginning of the school year because she wanted to know why I wasn't just giving her daughter harder and harder and harder math in the way that she thought about harder. She was like, you're working with things with my daughter that um, that she already knows how to do and by she already knows how to do was she knows how to get the answer and so what I really worked on with her was okay how do we take this deeper how do we think of another way to solve it how do we like you know really dig in there and so this like idea of complexity came in and like thinking about tasks and even like the concept of differentiation and how like differentiation was kind of taught to me as like you have different things for different students to do but when I think about everything we've been talking about in math, when we present tasks that are rich, they in themselves provide a, a type of differentiation because students can access them where they are and we can continue to push their thinking within that same task without having to create something new. And I think that the representations tie into this as well um, as you can see the way students are thinking. And, and so what my takeaway is, is noticing how the teacher um, moves through this piece like very intentionally how the goal is very intentionally for students to come up with different representations and so I know that's something that I've wanted my students to be able to do and thinking about STEM club for example but I don't think that I told them like my goal is for you to think through different ways to solve this and I don't think I explicitly said that to the teachers either it was like we want them to to use their own thinking 
we, you know, it's okay for them to come up with their own way to solve it. They don't need to know how to do division to solve this problem. Um, but being able to like realistic with my goals and then also being able to look at an example like this and like the teacher actions to be able to work closer with teachers on what are the teachers doing to, to help students make connections with their representations and move through them um, mm -hmm. into different ones or more complex ones or an, an, another way to think about it to help continue to, to flesh out their understanding deeper and deeper. Yes, I love that. That's a great, great takeaway. That's something I learned here too um, and I've taught a while. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, Susan, Heidi, and Molly, I really appreciate your contribution. I love it. And you guys are welcome to join us any of these weeks that we do. Steve, thank you so much for your expertise and, and Linda, your guidance uh, through this and helping uh, just me become more knowledgeable or just backing up what I say is, is really valuable. So thank you guys all so much. And thanks for thinking hard. Take care. Thank See you. Guys. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.